This is the third day in a series of so far very elementary lectures. And um, today I'm going to do something that's a little bit more advanced. Um, and remember that I'm really trying to give you an introduction to the more mathematical foundations, um, especially in numerical analysis. So I'm going to look at a high order scheme. And um, these always are more fun uh, from a certain point of view. So that's the, the main goal today. And I'll show you some computations one can do with it, which um, relate to other things that have been discussed. But first, I want to just go back and visit some things that have been discussed here in various lectures. Um, there's a, a, an important number that relates the importance of, of um, nonlinearity and, and dispersion in waterways. And it's been described variously as the Ursel number or the Stokes number. So I thought it would just be fun to make sure everybody knows who Ursel and Stokes and other people are or were, and were, unfortunately, in this case. So Fritz Ursel died just a, a year or so ago. Um, and he was a, a, a noted fluid dynamicist. Um, Stokes, of course, is a little bit better known, uh, but he's a uh, hundred years earlier, so he had time for his reputation to develop. He was what was known as senior wrangler at Cambridge University. So at, at Cambridge, and I was talking with Tim Warburton, Warburton about Oxford, they have a similar kind of test every year. So. Uh, the senior wrangler is the, the you know, the ma mathematician of the year. So they have a math exam. And um, you can even find current mathematicians who put that on their, on their resume, that they were senior wrangler when they graduated from undergraduate school at, at um, Cambridge. Um, why I put it on here is to note that he was a mathematician, and I actually didn't know that until I did this sort of historical research for a, a numerical analysis book, which is, is in the references here. I have a fairly recent advanced numerical analysis book in which I tried to give as much history as I could. And I was quite intrigued to find that Stokes had been senior wrangler. I'd always thought of him as somehow a fluid mechanician or something. Um, but not only that, um, he was together with um, someone named Zeidel, as in Gauss-Zeidel, the Gauss-Zeidel method. Well, truthfully, I didn't even know before this that it was really Zeidel. I, it could have been Seidel. You know, it could have been some Americanization or some other nationality taking that na German name and, and, and transforming it. But Zeidel was, in fact, a contemporary of Gauss, and he did uh, contribute to the iterative method known as the Gauss-Zeidel method. But the reason I mention it here is that Stokes and Zeidel are credited by historians as discovering or creating or whatever the notion of uniform convergence of functions. And at the time, so now we have to look at what time that would be, say in mid-1850s, somewhere like that, the notions of convergence of series of functions was not well understood. And for example, in Cauchy's time, there was some controversy um, about this. And so what something we take for granted in elementary math courses now, uniform convergence, was not known at the time that Stokes was senior wrangler. It was during his career that that concept was developed together with Zeidel, who was involved in numerical analysis to some extent as well. Um, and just to give you a reference point, um, someone who appeared um, around the time of Stokes, maybe a little bit younger, but had a very brief life, um, is Abel. And Abel, of course, is, is memorialized with the Abel Prize, often thought of as the Nobel Prize of mathematics. And so um, Abel, let's say just a few years earlier than uh, Stokes and, and Zeidel, has the following quote, and I don't mean to be dumping on anybody, but it is, it is humorous to see that Abel said, in analysis, one is largely concerned with functions that can be represented by power series. As soon as other functions enter, I think the heavy side function, 
um, and this happens rarely, then induction does not work anymore, and an infinite number of incorrect theorems arise from false conclusions. So this gives you a sense of how far mathematics has come in a relatively short period of time. And then I argue this is useful to note because you can, you can believe it will continue to develop, especially analysis is not done yet. And um, computational uh, analysis is uh, one, one area, or numerical analysis as we, as we call it, uh, is one area where I expect there can be continued developments. Okay, so that's Ursel and Stokes. So let's go on um, and talk about dispersion relations. Um, Professor Liu mentioned this in his, his uh, lectures, and I just want to make sure everybody really understands this in detail if you've, if you've never seen it before. Um, so in physics, you have the notion of, of a dispersion relation for a system, and the idea is that you, you somehow figure out a way to drive the system at um, a particular frequency. And so you have, you're going to have waves. And, and they're going to propagate. They're going to, they're going to oscillate with the, a certain frequency. And you can relate that to the wavelength of the waves. So you have a wave this long, and you see how, how rapidly it, it progresses. And the relationship between those two, where omega is the frequency and k is the wave number, um, is called the dispersion relation. And k here is, it's like a Fourier variable, it's, way to, it's a good way to think about it. Anyway, it's defined to be 2 pi over the wavelength of the, of the wave. And, and so, um, for example, you might have a simple situation where omega is proportional to k, that as you increase the wave number or decrease the wavelength, the frequency increases accordingly by some linear factor. And that's indicated by this dotted line here. And the shallow water theory is based on that assumption, that there's a linear relationship between omega and k. Now, someone asked me, so physically, why would you ever get something other than linear? And I had to say I don't know. So if anybody would like to contribute to that, that would be a good time. But it's just a property of, of a physical system that you ask, what is omega of k? And you find, and, and sometimes it has to be derived experimentally. Um, in the case of water waves, it's derived from the Navier-Stokes equations. And so here's the, here's the analytical experiment, which can be solved. So you have an infinite extent of water on a, on a flat bottom. And you ask, if I, if I have a periodic wave train extending out to infinity, what's the frequency with which it progresses? And so you can solve that. And you get this very strange relationship, k, tan h, k. Tan h is the hyperbolic tangent. Um, and you take the square root of that product. Now, if you think about your asymptotics, you say, well, OK, so tan h, k is essentially k for small k, so you get k, the square root of k squared, so you get omega of k equal to k for small k. So what I've done here is I've shown plot of this, not going down to k equal to 0, but starting at 0.4 and uh, going on. And so then there's the, the linear relationship is the, as, as we say, that's what shallow water is. And I have to look to see where the, so the exact, um, the exact curve, this k tan h k, is what's in red here, the solid line in red. And then these other approximations we've been talking about, kdv, bbm, and others, are shown with the other symbols. So in particular, kdv is the lowest one. It's this one down here. Um, and it is, um, I'll explain what the, the formula is on the next slide. but. At any rate, it tends to go off from the theoretical line uh, the most of all, all of these. And um, next is BBM, the plus, the red pluses is closer, a closer fit. And then um, Professor Liu mentioned the idea of optimizing the dispersion relation. And, and we had done this as well in a paper some years ago. And so the green stars are an optimized 
dispersion relation, uh, optimized within a class of relations that are easy to compute with. Okay, so let's just look at the, that's the, the picture. Um, and uh, one more comment here for interpretation. So uh, the part I left off below, below four over here um, is not so interesting because they all essentially have the same value. And that you can relate to, that's k less than or equal to 0.4. And that's the same, same thing as saying the wavelength is greater than about 16. Um, and then let me remind you of units. If we're talking about deep water, which I take to be 10 to the fourth meters, then um, we're talking about um, 160 kilometers. So when this is relating to the regime of 160 kilometers um, and, and below. So, um, okay. So this would be 160 kilometers, and then this is smaller wavelengths as you get. As lambda gets smaller, k gets larger. Okay, everybody clear on that? All right. So then here are the explicit relations written as, as mathematical formulas. The uh, omega of k equals k tan hk is the Navier-Stokes uh, exact relation for, for um, periodic wave trains with, which are, are on, on, a, on a free surface, which have um, uh, asymptotically zero amplitude, arbitrarily small amplitude. So that arises in the, in the limit of, of small amplitude. Um, the dispersion relation for shallow, the shallow water model is omega of k equal to k. And the dispersion relation for the VBM equation is k over 1 plus uh, 1 sixth k squared. And by the way, I have, in many of the computations, been leaving off the 1 6. I apologize for that. But of course, this is one of these exercises you're doing, so you can put in the 1 6 and see to what extent that changes things. Uh, one way to think about omega of k is it's the symbol of the differential operator that you're, you're dealing with here. And so um, you see in the denominator something that looks like the symbol of an elliptic operator. And of course, that's how BBM works. You have you invert this differential operator, this elliptic differential operator, in, in determining what the time derivative is. And the, the top is the symbol of simple differentiation. And so all that makes good sense. Um, the dispersion relation for KDB is just below it, K times 1 minus 1 6 K squared. And immediately you see that there's a simple way to think about these, that these are um, you know, simple, simply related by uh, an expansion for 1 over x in terms of the powers of, of x. Um, and so they're really uh, close cousins in that, in that sense. But, but there's a fundamental difference in how they, the, the models behave in a numerical sense because now you have a third order derivative in the symbol and, and third order derivatives are a little bit more difficult to uh, handle. Whereas with the BBM model, you essentially have no derivatives. As k goes to infinity, this symbol goes to zero. And so it has, it has the strength of a, of a multiplicative operator, just something. In fact, it's even smoothing. So it uh, plays the role of a smoothing operator. So that's why I say solving BBM is like solving an ordinary differential equation. OK. Now, um, now that you know that this dispersion relation is related to the concept of a, 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 a differential operator. It's the symbol of the differential operator. You could say, well, why don't I go down here and I'll just pick some coefficients to fit that k10hk square root uh, equation better, at least in some range. I could say I'm only interested in wavelengths in a certain range. And so we did that with some numbers here that are not very different from the, the the ones that get derived in the, in the asymptotic expansion of Navier-Stokes, uh, but they do fit better than, than uh, BBM. So you go from the um, red pluses to the green stars, and you see you can get a better fit in that, in that range. Um, and it corresponds to just a slightly different differential equation. The, the, the form is the same, but the coefficients are slightly different. And so um, that's the idea of optimizing the the symbol and optimizing the model. Okay, dispersion relations. So let's get back to the numerics. 
Um, so how is it we are going to solve this uh, equation? It's, um, we have uh, a differential operator, essentially 1 minus d dx squared, multiplying ut equal to minus uh, the, the derivative of a, of a nonlinear term. So we have to figure out how do we, how do we solve that? Well, I introduced the filter function before, and that works, although it's, it is work to get it to work. Uh, you have to do a correction for the fact that it has, filter uses funny boundary conditions. Um, and here is the, the standard way of creating a sparse matrix to represent the difference operator associated with this. So this is a simple centered difference operator, nothing fancy here. I just, for various reasons, um, I put a coefficient alpha here, which will be 1 for the BBM equation, and that factors into this coefficient I called alpha with an f instead of pH. Um, and with, with that definition and, and understanding what dx is, that that's the, the spatial, uh, the, the mesh size, spatial mesh size, then we just go through these loops and define the diagonal terms and the off-diagonal terms and so forth, and then we, uh, and the, the indices corresponding to them, and then we put that into um, this, sorry, there we go. And then you put it into this operator in Act Octave or MATLAB, and that creates a sparse matrix for you. So again, if you don't do that, if you were to create this, uh, this difference operator as a full matrix, it would be incredibly slow um, as you were experimenting with in your, um, in your programming exercises. So this now will be the next step in the programming exercises to put in the, this difference operator and implement the BBM equation and see what happens. Okay, so I introduced the similar thing called FOD, the first order difference method, um, in the previous slides. And um, now if you have this new one, then you can write the BBM algorithm as here. So I've got um, u plus u squared. That's the, the advection term. I'm going to take the first order difference of that. So I've got the derivative of u plus u squared. And I'm, if, if you haven't seen this notation before, it may seem a little bit odd, but it's, I'm going to divide by a matrix. So what does that mean to divide by a matrix? Well, it means you're going to solve a system of equations, or I'm going to multiply by the inverse. But the, this backslash notation is a way to, the way at least I think about it is, the thing on the right is in the numerator, and the thing on the left is in the denominator. And the thing in the denominator is a matrix, a little bit strange to think about, but that's really what you want to do. You've got, in your equation, you've got this second order derivative operator on the left hand side multiplying ut, you want to divide by that and, and that's the algebraic way to do that. So now that's the simple loop for solving the BBM equation. Before if we didn't have the dispersion term we just had this first order difference and all we're going to do is create this sparse matrix and divide by it in this, in this notation. That tells um, Octave to do or, or, or MATLAB to, to solve that system of equations. And um, it's very fast because these are, uh, are banded sparse matrices. So that, that um, is the, that it turns out is what I've been doing in all of these. I, I got tired of, of, of wrestling with filter and so I just took the easy way out. And I had, if you remember I'd done the tests and for large numbers of, of mesh points, filter was faster, but uh, not enough to keep me up at night. So I, I went on to this. I, and that's just a, a, to make an aside. There's, it's an interesting question. Where do you stop developing numerical methods? And there's no simple answer. At a certain point, there are diminishing returns. Don't be embarrassed you know, if you stop with a first order scheme or a second order scheme and you're get, because you've gotten the, the science out that you want to. Um, you can always come back later. And, and make it make it uh, higher order or more efficient. Um, but uh, I at least want you to know that those options are out there. 
Okay, so how do you test uh, a finite difference approximation? Well, one of the ways you can do it is by knowing an exact solution, one that's fairly complex, and one that then you can compare with. So we have these solitary ways, and they're, they're exact solutions, and they, they're um, simple exact solutions in that they're just uh, translations of uh, a simple waveform to the right. So they look like they're solving ut plus ux equal to zero. Um, and here's an example with, um, well, let's say a modest mesh size. Uh, the spatial mesh size is 0.1, and the temporal, uh, the time stepping for a simple forward Euler time stepping is 0.01, so it's not, you know, it's not terribly big. But you get a big error. So the, the red curve is the initial data. The green curve is what you'd get if you just simply translated it to the right, and the blue curve is the computational curve in this case. So you see that the computational error is pretty big. And um, to get a sense of how reasonable uh, these mesh sizes are, um, we have the domain is 80 units long, the x is 0.1. It's 800 points. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's not, it's not, I haven't fudged here by making it so, the mesh so crude that uh, things fall apart. The real culprit is more in the time stepping, and yet, I, yet I've taken the time step 10 times smaller than the spatial step, and yet you get something that clearly could cause some problems later. So let's just look into that a little bit. So what happens? So I'm, I'm taking explicit Euler, and I've, I've shown the, the errors, the relative maximum errors for various values of dx and dt, and then compared that with the CPU time, just to get a sense of how it works. And so I can indeed, um, with a reasonable amount of time, get down to an error of order less than 10 to the minus 2 um, with that scheme. But um, it's very easy to take uh, explicit Euler and change it into a second order scheme. Explicit Euler is first order in time. Um, the finite difference approximation we're doing in space is second order. It's a, everything was done symmetric, and so it's not hard to believe that that's a second order uh, in, time, in space uh, operator. So, um, th and, and I'll talk about that just to give you some confidence about that. But this first order dif time differencing then is, is the real Achilles heel here. And so um, there are lots of different kinds of uh, second order schemes one can consider. Predictor corrector um, is the following scheme. So I take, I take one Euler step and that gives me um, a candidate for the next, uh, the, the solution at the next time step. That's Y with a hat on it. And so then what I do is I essentially take a step with um, that looks like an implicit Euler step. But instead of doing full implicit Euler, I approximate the implicit information that I need by y hat, and then I average those two. And in averaging, so I've taken an explicit Euler and one step of implicit Euler approximated by, by explicit Euler, and that's the predictor concept. And um, then I've averaged the two, and that gives you something second order. So that's pretty simple to do. And you notice that all of a sudden, you get, you know, sort of as much accuracy as you want for a reasonable amount of time here. So much, much faster than explicit Euler. So that's, that's something worth doing. And if you've never seen this in practice, um, the, the, the step from a first-order method to a second-order method is huge, and you'll hear a lot about that. This is a good exercise to do. When you, when you really feel it on your own computer, I think it's... It gives you a better sense of it, so I encourage you to do that exercise. Um, okay. Now, as I said, there are many, many second-order schemes that you can think of, and one of them is leapfrog, and leapfrog has only one function evaluation. The, the, the previous one, the, the um, predictor-corrector scheme, has two function evaluations. First, you have to evaluate f of yi, and then you have to evaluate f of yi hat. That looks like a typo to me. That should be i plus 1. I apologize for that. 
Um, and uh, I'll get that corrected before I ship it off to you. But the point is, you, you, you throw away this YI hat value. You never use that, and you never use that again either. So, so you're, you're doing an extra function evaluation. The leapfrog scheme avoids that. It's centered in time, so it's a, it's a differencing in time from going from I minus 1 to I plus 1, and the function evaluation is in the middle, and that way you only have to do one function evaluation, and that's second order accurate in time. The difficulty is that you need an extra starting point. So to get this started, not only do you need y at 0, you need y at minus 1. And so one thing you can do is you can say take explicit Euler, uh, take, I'm sorry, take predictor corrector for one step to get a, a second order approximation at, at the, the next step. And then you use those two uh, steps to get um, the um, leapfrog scheme going. Or all, This scheme is also known as Verlet in the molecular dynamics world. Um, so exercises I am suggesting are to implement leap, leapfrog schemes, see how it compares with predictor corrector in terms of accuracy and efficiency. Okay. Um, so um, as I say, we've, we've taken a, um, centered schemes for d by dx and d by dx squared and put them together in some way. So we expect the combination is going to be second order. But there's a way to prove this. And uh, I wanted to just delve in that a little bit. Um, there's no universal way to prove that difference methods converge. Um, and it's nice to know some of them. Um, and so this one's a little bit unusual. It, it sort of relates to the dispersive character of it, this XXT character. Um, and so I just thought I would go through that. So um, when you invert uh, a differential operator, you can do that by uh, convolving with the Green's function. So the Green's function is a function, or it's a, a distribution uh, generalized function that satisfies the operator times this Green's function equal to the delta function. And so that concept has been known uh, for many years, a lot longer than the concept, the abstract concept of distributions, which made it made it rigorous, uh, and it is essentially convolving with with functions that are known. So, for example, here, my second order derivative operator has this as the uh, Green's function. So you can check that. Um, uh, sorry, this is the. Uh, let me let me do the derivation. So. Um, Let's start with the Green's function, g, of 1 minus d by dx squared. So that's 1 half e to the minus absolute x. Um, so you can check that. You just you differentiate it twice. And what will happen? Well, you just get, when you differentiate e to the minus x, you will get a minus sign each time. So you do it twice, and you're going to get back to plus, and then you're going to add it to itself, and you'll get zero. So that's pretty easy to see that that is, in fact, um, the, the operator applied to G is zero everywhere except at zero where um, there were discontinuities. And you have to check that the discontinuities correspond to the concept of the, of the delta function. So if you haven't seen that before, it's a little bit that requires some uh, more advanced math, and so I won't try to go into that, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it offline. And then, now what do we have? We have this second order operator, the inverse of that, applied to the first derivative operator. And so probably you'll believe that um, because convolution and, and differentiation commute, that the Green's function for that operator is going, going to be the derivative of g. So k is the derivative of g, and that's where we get this expression which I claimed down here on the bottom. Okay. So that's, we summarized this somewhere. So this is the BBM equation. So in other words, I can think of it as just, it's an ordinary differential equation involving a convolution. So it, it, it's, it's an ordinary differential equation at a whole bunch of points, and you put them together by convolving 
uh, with a kernel k, and the kernel is not so bad. It goes to zero exponentially and so forth. Um, so my colleague Jerry Bona uh, wrote a code just implementing exactly as you see. And uh, the only problem with that is convolutions involve a lot of data points, you know, intervals. The interval goes off to infinity, and so he, he did some numerical scheme going off to infinity, and it was rather inefficient to do it. Um, but, but there's the scheme. So this, this is the scheme here for computing the, the time derivative and um, where you've got your, your nonlinear function of u here. And, and so that's a, that's a scheme that could be used to solve the, the DBM equation. But it involves order n squared work where n is the size of the computational domain in, in terms of grid points. Um, and it's possible to to simplify this by, by making uh, some observations. I, I don't know, for me it was useful to break it apart and realize that the, this kernel k is, is simply an exponential. Um, and so somehow if I applied a differential operator to it, then, um, you know, we don't, the exponential is a solution to lots of differential equations. So somehow we ought to be able to apply a differential operator to this expression and make most of these terms go away, or even a difference operator, because again, exponentials are solutions of difference operators. Um, and so, let's try that. So, let's here's our here's our scheme, which looks v is ut. It looks very inefficient, but I'm going to apply a, a second-order difference operator to v and see what happens. So um, I've used this filter notation here to define the, that should be on the right here. Here's the filter um, way of defining things. So I've got a difference operator um, B, which is uh, just one here, I guess. And then the operator on the left-hand side comes from the uh, the filter coefficients for A, and um, so it's the second order difference operator times a very funny coefficient. I'll explain the coefficient in a minute, but let's just assume that we've got that coefficient in the denominator. And I take that operator and I apply it to the convolution expression above and see what happens. Well, because I've chosen that coefficient to be the way it is, um, I end up with zero um, for all indices bigger than one, and also zero by symmetry for i equal to zero. And then I get the expression that's shown down here. So I get this expression for i equal to plus or minus one. So i is playing the role of index here and also one of the coefficients, so it gives I gives me the plus or minus one that I would otherwise write differently. Okay, so you have to check that. This is a bunch of algebra, but you check that. You say, okay, that, that works. So what does that say? That says when I apply that second order difference operator to nine, I get something that's quite local. In fact, uh, you realize because of the plus or minus one character that, that the index I gives you, it's really a, a difference operator. Um, so here's the computation that, that leads to that. So it's, it's somewhat long-winded. But in the end, what it tells you is that um, you can interpret, I, 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 interpret the um, coefficient, this h over da-da-da-da-da, as plus or minus 1 over 2h. So that's where you get your, your first-order difference operator from. Um, okay. So... What I'm saying is we can write an equation where we have a second order difference times v, that's going to be the ut term, equal to a first order difference of the nonlinear term. And um, where the nonlinear term, where, where the first order difference operator is defined as, as shown there with this funny coefficient which plays the role of a per, it's, it's order h with a, with a, a perturbation. Um, and um, so taking that to be 
ut, you've got a second order um, scheme because I've taken trapezoidal rule, which is second order approximation to that convolution equation, and I've ended up with this centered difference equation that is therefore second order. So that's a proof that it, you have to write down some convergence estimates for, for trapezoidal rule and so forth, and you have to worry about what's happening at infinity, but those are minor details. Um, now, this is not exactly with the announced uh, values of H, so to go from here to uh, proving that the original scheme of second order does require some work, but at least it tells you that with appropriate coefficients, um, you get a, a scheme that is second order in space. And there is that. Um, this is the, that expression, that coefficient, and you can expand it in a very simple way to, to see that, in fact, it looks like just 1 over h plus a correction term of order h cubed. Okay. So um, that tells us we've got a second order scheme. Um, now, it also gives us a way to go to higher order accuracy, and that's what I just wanted to mention briefly. So um, there's a very interesting quadrature rule called the euler maclaurin formula. Maybe it should be considered to be more general than a quadrature rule, but at any rate, I interpret it as a quadrature rule. And what it does is it adds derivative corrections. So it says the integral of a function, 0 to infinity, is trapezoidal rule plus a derivative in correction. And I'm saying, suppose my function goes to 0 at infinity very rapidly. There would also be an end correction at infinity, but we'll ignore that. Um, and it just involves taking the derivative of the function at 0. That gives you a fourth order scheme. If you added the third derivative, you could get a sixth order scheme and so forth. So the euler maclaurin formula is the entire set of, of schemes and um, you can refer to my book on numerical analysis for a derivation of this. So here's a way to go from uh, second order to fourth order by just adding one term at zero. So I haven't changed the quadrature rule. The quadrature rule is still trapezoidal rule. I just add one term at one place, and so that makes it seem plausible that um, it's going to be easy to do. Um, so there's the application to the convolution integral that we have to evaluate. Um, in our case, we can compute that derivative. So the, um, down here we have this computation. So kf prime is going to be, and the brackets mean the jump. We, we need to know what the jump is because we're applying the, we're applying the um, Euler-Maclaurin formula to the integral from 0 to infinity and from minus infinity to 0. And you see that that derivative term effectively gives you a jump term. Um, and so you work out the expression, and you see, well, it really does simplify. So this rather complicated expression here works out to be just minus the derivative of f at 0. So um, you can keep a fourth order scheme by approximating this term to second order. It's, it's a second order correction. All you have to do is approximate it to second order. And that gives you a fourth order scheme. And, and note that this second order approximation is something we will have done anyway in, in developing the, the method. So we have a simple modification to the scheme to get something second order. So here are some definitions. So we define that j hat to be that um, first order difference operator. Um, and j hat is lost its hat. Okay, so I apologize that there's another notational uh, typo there. So I, um, it's just j, let's say. So j is just a simple uh, constant multiple of um, the first order difference operator d. And um, d is, has a 1 over h, and, and j has uh, h squared times d. So uh, j has uh, h in the numerator. Um, but that's the, that's the simple relationship. So um, now we can approximate uh, ut by a combination of things to get something second order. We, here's the part that we had before. We inverted that to get ut. Um, and we're going to add to it 
a, a simple difference operator applied to the right hand side to f of the, the nonlinear term. And we add those two together and we've got something fourth order. Okay, so let's just see how well that performs. So again, we'll compare with the predictor corrector second order scheme that I described before, where you can get quite substantial accuracy. But you get the same accuracy with the fourth order scheme in a fraction of a second, quite literally. And um, you can go to quite high order if, if required. So um, this is describing um, the results of that, that fourth order spatial approximation together with the runga kutta scheme. Um, and I thought my runga kutta scheme was right after it. Um, where did my runga kutta scheme go? Okay, I will find it later. Um, but let's just see, so there's a fourth order runga kutta scheme applied to, to obtain that. And let's just see how well it performs. So what, I, I mean, these are, these are single solitary wave tests. Um, and so we should look at something a little bit more challenging. And it, um, before we started work on this, it had been noticed that the solitary waves for the BBM equation do not interact perfectly. There is what's called a dispersive tail that is emitted, and, and the, the sizes of the solitary waves change a little bit. So for KDV, that doesn't happen. There's perfect soliton interaction. For BBM, um, there isn't. And so it's of interest maybe to understand how big that is and so to do that, to visualize it, what you have to do is you have to truncate the solitary waves. At, at the, so these are solitary waves of, of amplitude 6 and, and 1.5, but they've been truncated down here at, at 0, 0.025. And that's the size of its dispersive tail. So the big the little nubs there are the, the solitary waves going way off page. Um, and so here are some of the, the numbers. That, so... Um, the larger solitary wave increases in amplitude. Um, there is uh, a dispersive tail of small amplitude, and the solitary, the solitary wave decreases in amplitude. That's what was reported in our, our calculations some decades ago. Um, and you can, with these higher order schemes, you can, and these new supercomputers we have on our uh, Laps, you can do uh, quite a, a large parameter study to see how these things uh, behave. And so I've, for, for the larger solitary wave amplitude fixed at 6, I've looked at the, uh, the changes in these numbers as a function of the size of the smaller solitary wave and just plotted it. So in blue, you see the amplitude of the dispersive tail, negative the amplitude of the dispersive tail. It's always, uh, I'm taking the, the minimum value that it achieves. Um, and then in green, it's the, the decrease in the size of the smaller, uh, smaller solitary wave, and red is the increase in size of the um, larger solitary wave. So just something of some mathematical interest, but not so relevant to tsunamis. Uh, maybe more relevant to the course is what uh, a runga kutta method looks like. This is one of them. Um, it's a fourth order scheme. It's closely related to the numerical quadrature rule, Simpson's rule, which you'll remember is involves the endpoints and the middle point. And we have two approximations for the middle point given by uh, the oops, W1 and W2 here because we step across by one half of the interval length. Um, the runga kutta scheme has the property that given an initial value, it will produce um, the, next, uh, the value at the next time step without any extra information from behind. It does it through internal calculations, and these are the internal calculations. So you take all these internal calculations and then sum them up, and here's where it looks like. You'll notice uh, Simpson's rule, which is 1 over 6 times 1, 4, 1, and the 4 term gets split into two twos here, and what's mysterious is how all that adds up to be fourth order. There are a bunch of second order approximations going on, or even first order approximations going on, and uh, it miraculously cancels and gives you um, a fourth order scheme. It unfortunately has four function evaluations at every time step. So you could imagine something like um, the um, Adams-Bashford or Adams-Moulton methods. Adams-Moulton is implicit. 
Uh, so let's start off with Adams Bash fourth. There it is. Uh, like Leapfrog, you need a lot of initial uh, values to get started. So you could say generate those by Runge-Kutta. And then in this scheme, you only need two function evaluations per time step. Uh, this is a predictor-corrector type scheme. The Adams-Moulton is implicit. I'm using the, the Adams-Bashforth prediction. That's the hatted uh, variable. And um, I put that in where it, the, the implicit term would be. And the resulting scheme is fifth order. Um, now, it's interesting because I'm using fourth order Adams Bashforth and fifth order Adams Moulton in a predictor corrector mode, and the resulting scheme is actually fifth order. It's, it's an interesting point that what, to, to get higher order, you, you can start with a one order lower scheme and get the, the next, get one higher order than that um, if you don't do it too long. And so that's an example of this. So here's a fifth order in time scheme that um, needs a few steps to get started. And um, here's a comparison of that with, with the Runge-Kutta method, comparing CPU time and error. And the take-home message here is, well, may, if you work hard, you can get this fifth order method to be a little bit more efficient, but you have to play around with the relationship between delta t and delta x. Um, and so, um, in the end, I didn't use it very much. I mean, I, I, it would be nice to have a higher accurate scheme, but the Runge-Kutta method does pretty well in terms of giving you reasonable efficiency for comparable CPU time. But it is, it is formally, a, the adams moulton method is formally higher order. Here is where you can see it in a more conventional convergence test, where you take the spatial step equal to the temporal step, and even though the, the spatial discretization is fourth order with the um, adams moulton method with the triangles here, you see that it appears to be a fully fifth order scheme. And um, the, the lines in particular are at fourth order and fifth order. Um, and so it says that really what's dominating here is the time stepping error. And so that's why I tended to do computations with smaller Time, space, uh, time steps smaller than the spatial steps. Um, once you have these higher order schemes, you can do lots of fun experiments. And this is actually re relevant to one of the papers discussed yesterday um, by Hamak and, and um, Seeger. Uh, and so I've given the reference here, so you'll have it the Hamak Seeger paper, 1974. Um, which observe that if you start with a general wave shape down here, so this is t equal to zero, that it will break up into a series of solitary waves um, if the amplitude is big enough. And of course, I've also shown that when the amplitude is smaller, you don't get that. You just get a straight dispersive tail. But this is kind of fun to see um, because what's happening here is that there is a quantization effect that's going on. So I'm starting with Gaussian waveform to begin with of a certain amplitude. And depending on the amplitude, this will break up into a different number of solitary waves. And as far as I can tell, you could get as many solitary waves as you want by taking the amplitude higher. But the point is, it's a discrete number. So at some point, it's got to decide whether it's going to be k or k plus 1 solitary waves. So there's some decision process there that, that takes this continuous variable, the amplitude, and, and gives you a discrete or quantized set of solitons. Um, so I find that kind of interesting to think about what, it, what must it look like when it goes from k to k plus 1, and I'm still kind of playing around with that. I don't know is the sure answer. But here's a picture of what happens in the initial breakup phase. Um, the, the Gaussian wave steepens, uh, just like we know a nonlinear expression would, and you get something nearly vertical, and then um, the the solitary waves begin to break out. And so rather than this wave breaking, or even becoming discontinuous, the uh, dispersion takes over and starts pulling out solitary waves as you go and, and getting a rather large number depending on amplitude. So this was an amplitude 10 um, wave to start with. Clearly not relevant for, for tsunamis. OK, and here are some of the references there. So, what I'd like to do now, uh, 
It's just, um, uh, of course, I'll put that on the on the course webpage shortly. But now, what I'd like to do is look at a um, paper that looks at the Boussinesq equations. You know, KDB and BBM are only one dimensional, so that's fun to play with on your laptop. But now, suppose we want to get serious, and you've heard a lot about the Boussinesq equations, um, and I want to introduce you to the Phoenix Project a little bit in this paper. So the Phoenix Project is a project which automates the generation of uh, software for simulation, primarily through finite element discretization so far, or, although there is nothing intrinsic in our, in our approach that limits it to finite elements. But this paper actually will be a finite element approximation. Um, and uh, the, the key thing about the Phoenix Project is that they're tools that allow you to write down the differential equation, no matter how complicated, in a simple form, and then the code is generated automatically from that form. And it's a little bit of magic, but uh, it's a dream we've had for many years, and now the Phoenix Project has implemented that. And so let me just describe that. So this paper introduces the Boussinesq equations and applies it to simulations in this harbor in Portugal. These are Portuguese researchers, so that's what they were interested in. It's what happens when a tsunami hits this, this harbor. Um, and they do a very good job of um, giving you all the background here and deriving the model equations from the Navier-Stokes equations. So you've seen these derivations in Professor Liu's talks. They're a little bit complicated, but he said it's, you know, it's good for your soul to go through these. So here's, here's a, a paper that will help you go through it, and, and you see the the mu term and the epsilon term and mu to the fourth, mu eight, you know, and so forth. So there's all these expansions. Um, and eventually you end up with some um, differential equations, which are shown here. So that's the, the, the set of model equations. I guess I can make it a little bit lower down here. That's the set of model equations down at the bottom. And what you see is very similar to BBM in that the, there's a time derivative of eta, that's the wave height. Um, and um, over here, let me just, I, I know I'm going to lose my microphone, but over here you see an elliptic operator applied to the time derivative of eta, another one here, another one here. So second order derivatives applied to the time derivative of eta. So this BBM equation is not somehow mysterious. It really goes back to Boussinesq's original derivation of these, of these <coughs> models. Okay, so there are the differential equations, and I guess, I, I hope you appreciate why it would be useful to be able to automate the code generation for that, because there are a lot of terms there, and they're complicated. So how do you do that? Well, um, here's their discussion about um, dispersion relations, but here's what you do. So you apply the, the variational formulation. So the variational formulation can be thought of as a way to generate finite element equations, or it can be thought of as a technique for understanding differential equations. One of the, it's the simplest and, and most widely used technique for figuring out whether or not differential equations are well posed or not. It puts things typically in a Hilbert space setting where you can reason most easily about the existence of solutions and it arises simply by multiplying by a test function and integrating by integrating over the domain and integrating by parts, and you end up with equations that look like this. So maybe that looks more complicated to you, but that's a way that you're you're constrained in writing out this variational approximation um, uh, in, in a way that's useful for limiting the, the kinds of mistakes that can be typically made. But once you've done that, once you have that variational formulation, then you can simply translate that into code. And this is really the code um, in, in Phoenix. This is real uh, variational form code for describing those expressions. And you see down at the bottom the various um, expressions for the, the forms. And that's all it takes to describe the, the simulation. And then the, you give to the, the dolphin code this um, expression, which is a sum of their six different terms to get the, the variational form. And that's really it. There is very little more. I'll let you 
read the rest of this at your leisure, but that's really all you have to do to write a code. This is, it. This is from the Phoenix book. So this book appeared, yes. And um, I will put this paper on the, the website. I could put the whole book there. It's sort of freely available. Um, I, meant to, I meant to include... A, Yes. Okay. I will do that. I will do that. Um, I forgot. I, I just I simply forgot to do it for today. But I'll put it out. I'll, I'll, I'll edit my slide. So the last slide will give you the address to go to the, a link to to pick it up. And if you have any trouble, I have it on my laptop. I can send it to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's just we're dancing around the copyright restrictions here. But yeah, it was it was well done. These guys worked hard at it. So there's a big book on the Phoenix Project and and explains how it works and, and all the different applications that have been done. Here, Busanesk is, is one example, and let me just give you some, you know, some motivation here. There are lots of pretty pictures. They did various tests, and they eventually got down to their harbor, and um, uh, there are all the tests, lots and lots of tests, very careful, um, and more tests. <laughs> so it's a long paper, but... Um, but it means you don't have to do all that work. There's the harbor, um, and um, they give you some computational results like that, that you can look at and decide whether they look reasonable or not. Okay, so I'll stop with that, and um, uh, next time I want to go on to a more advanced topic. One that is, the, the relationship to tsunamis is going to be more speculative. I want to look at non-Newtonian flows. And we've seen pictures of the, the tsunami with the, the front, the leading front that was very black from somehow some sort of particulate matter that was picked up in the bay, presumably. Well, we don't really know at this point. But it's clear that the, the, once the tsunami comes near land, it becomes a much more complicated fluid. It's not just the simple water that you find in the ocean. And so I want to look at what is known about non-Newtonian fluids, fluids with, with a substantial amount of particulate matter in them. And just to kind of give you the idea that um, there's more to think about for the future um, and that the math is getting better and better on that and gives you some pointers of what, what we know and don't know. And then I also want to mention some open problems because I think there's some interesting ones here to, to think about. So I will continue that tomorrow morning.